This morning, there is really just uh, one question before us that I want to deal with, and um, I think it's a very important question, particularly in our day, and uh, the question is simply this, can we separate Christ as Saviour from Christ as Lord? And you will see, as we go through, hopefully this morning, you'll see the implications of what I'm uh, saying this morning. Can we separate Christ as Saviour from Christ as Lord? Or, perhaps more to the point, does the Bible separate Christ as Saviour from Christ as Lord? Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and uh, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Iniquity is sin. So, if we can get anything from, from that short passage that I read to you, it should become apparent straight away that just sort of saying, Lord, Lord, just, just the use of that word, it really has no meaning, does it? it it's just a simple phrase that we use. The Bible doesn't deal in magic words, you know, or magic phrases. It deals in words that have meaning. And so if we just say, Lord, Lord, uh, here I am, Lord, he's saying, but your lifestyle, the way you lived, the way you regarded me, never showed that I was your Lord, it was just simply a word um, that, you were, that you were using. You were workers of iniquity, um, and, uh, and, and you'll notice the context here, he's talking about entering into the kingdom of heaven, isn't he? He's talking about, what's entering into the kingdom of heaven? It is salvation. It is salvation, first of all, uh, here on earth, where we, uh, we receive that gift uh, by the grace of God, but it's through faith that that gift is appropriate in our lives. But ultimately, the, the, there is the salvation when when we are uh, when we pass over into glory, as they used to say. Uh, uh, there was the salvation army used to say, promoted to glory. When you die, you, you, you go to be with the Lord in heaven, and then there will be a further salvation when Jesus Christ returns. And we are resurrected and will forever and will be with the Lord. So however you want to look at it, that salvation seems to be connected, doesn't it, with this idea of, of not just saying Lord, but it actually having some real meaning in your life. Now, he will always be the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether, whether you and I believe it, accept it or not, he will always be the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be the same yesterday, today, and forever. But what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do? How does that affect my salvation? Well, first of all, let, let's define the term, shall we? Uh, the word Lord, as it is generally used in the New Testament, is the Greek word uh, kurios. There it is. Kurios, and um, you, w when you read through your New Testament, uh, uh, places like uh, Romans 10, 13, um, Romans 10, 9, where you see this word Lord applied to Jesus, um, it's, it's, it's the word kurios, or, or maybe a different ending to it, but, but it's basically that word, uh, the Greek word kurios. What does it mean? Well, it means master. It means supreme authority. It means the controller, the one who's in, in, in control. Now, 
the Old Testament, as you, I'm sure you'll know, was not written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And, and if you've got a Bible like mine, I'm reading from the authorised version, when, when you look at the word Lord in English there, you'll notice it's capital L-O-R-D. And what that does is it signifies uh, a, a number of letters, Y-H-W-H, I'll give it to you in the English, uh, Y-H-W-H, because in the Old Testament, when they wrote down the name of the Lord, it, it was so precious to them, they didn't want to write the full name out of a mark of respect. So we have this Y-H-W-H, which we, we generally call Yahweh, or the older version would be Jehovah. You've heard that? And this is, if you speak to a Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness, this is, this is big, important stuff for them, you know, the name of the Lord. Uh, what does it mean? So I'll have a look at it now. I've got it in the Hebrew. So there, there you are. You read from uh, from right to, to left. Uh, if you can picture that Y H W H from from right to left. Um, what does it mean? Well, it, it, the translation would mean, uh, or rather, the, the definition would mean self-existent, the eternal, uh, the name of the Lord. So, uh, or the ne sorry, the name of God. So you can see there that, that Yahweh or Jehovah is the name of God. Uh, uh, now, what is interesting is when we get a sort of crossover in the text. So, for example, um, in Romans ten thirteen, it says, "For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Uh, the application is to do with Jesus and the name Lord there is kurios in the Greek, okay? But it is actually a quote from the Old Testament. Uh, it's a quote from Joel 2, 32. So in the Old Testament, the word is Yahweh, indicating the name of God. Now isn't that interesting how something is applied to Jesus in the New Testament and he's called Lord... And then when we look at, well, where does that come from? It comes from the, the book of the prophet Joel. Hey, in the book of the prophet Joel, it's being applied to God himself. Isn't that interesting? So, when we talk about the lordship of Christ, the fact that he is Lord, and we've already looked at just saying, Lord, Lord, has no meaning. But if we say, okay, he is Lord, what does that mean? It means that actually it's not just a title we give him, but it's actually a statement of his deity, of the fact that he's God. He is the Lord. In other words, he is God. Okay, that's massively important when it comes to our salvation, isn't it? That God became a man. That uh, um, he was man God was manifest in the flesh. That's what the Bible teaches, isn't it? So, so let's have a look at some conclusions then. So apologies if this sounds a bit simplistic. I, I, I know, I feel I'm labouring the point a bit, but it's important. Salvation is in Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Lordship and salvation are in a sense, and certainly in this sense, inextricable, aren't they? Remember what the verse was quoted to you? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whosoever shall call upon the name of the Saviour shall be saved. That wouldn't be wrong, but that's not what the Bible says. So what the Bible is doing is tying these two things in together, the Lordship of Christ and the salvation that comes through Him. He is the Lord. The title Lord and the verb saved are deliberately put together in order to illustrate the nature of salvation. Can Jesus be your saviour or not your Lord? Or to put it another way, can you be saved without it costing you anything in terms of commitment to him? as being Lord. Well, we're saved by grace, through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8. 
Praise God. I'm glad we are. I'm glad that I don't have to work for my salvation. Um, as the hymn says, just as I am, without one plea, but, but that thy blood was shed for me. That's how we come to God, isn't it? We don't try and clean ourselves up first and uh, look, you know, get my life really sorted out and then I can come to Christ for salvation. No, come to him now, come as you are. Because it's all about grace. William Tyndale said, grace, all grace is absolutely right. But did you know that grace teaches us something? Grace teaches us something. What does it teach us? Let's go to Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. Is that the second Timothy? Titus 2, verse 11. But the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, yes, but listen what it says, verse 12, teaching us, grace teaches you, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. So yes, we are saved by grace, but that grace is teaching us something else, that we should, that we should be aware, as Jude puts it, of ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jude says. Keep that, that phrase, denying the Lord Jesus Christ, in a little shelf in your mind. We're going we're to pick that back off again later on. But just keep that in mind. Denying the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of God is not separate from his lordship. Neither is the abuse of grace without condemnation in the New Testament. If Christ is not your Lord, then I have a question to ask you. Who is your Lord? Who is your kurios? Your Yahweh? Your God? Who is your Lord? There is no lordship, no man's land. A, a, a little place in between where you can be. There is no lordship, no man's land. The Bible says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die, but if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live, Romans 8, 13. So are you living after the flesh or after the Spirit? Are you dead or are you alive? Are you in darkness or are you in the light? There's no place in the middle where you can be. You're either one or the other. In Acts 16, verse 30, we read about the account of the Philippian jailer. And he comes, do you remember? Trembling before Paul and, and Silas, I think it is, isn't it? Paul and Silas comes trembling before them. He's afraid, he's fearful. And he asks a question, doesn't he? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said... Believe on the Saviour Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. There you go. Easy, isn't it? What shall I do if we say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, thou shalt be saved. Now it sounds very easy. Yet you know often in the scriptures. Uh, a simple statement is the sum of, a more, of more complex ideas and, and actions, isn't it? It's often the Bible puts it simply, but when we start to, as they, the modern term would be, unpack it, as we start to look at that, what, what, what is that actually saying to us? We see there's a lot to it. Believe, he says. Believe. The, the definition of that word is to put trust in, to commit to. Now, we know it doesn't just mean 
believe in the existence of, because James deals with that particular issue, doesn't he? He says, well, you know, if you just believe in God, and you, even if you believe in one God, said the devils believe that, and they tremble. Some people believe that, they don't even tremble. So in that sense, the devils have, have got more sound doctrine than they have, you know? They believe, but it doesn't really affect their life, does it? They've not committed to it. They've not uh, uh, put their trust in Jesus. They just believe he exists. Maybe he was a good man. Maybe something like that. So we must believe, commit, put your trust in. In who? In the Lord, your master, your supreme authority, your controller. The Lord Jesus means what? Saviour. He who saves. Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. See how that Lord, the one who is in control, the one who is telling you what to do, Lord, and Jesus, the Saviour, the one who saves, put right together, aren't they? They're right next door to you. How, how do I get saved? You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not the only thing that the Bible has to say about salvation, isn't it? That we haven't just got uh, Acts 16, verse 30. That's not the only thing that God has said on the subject. Just the same as we don't just take one gospel, do we? And say, well, I've got, there I've got the gospel. No, there are four. Why are there four? Because some of them don't mention things that the other writers mention. And so we put all four together to get a good picture of what the gospel is. And we don't want to lose one of them and say, well, I don't really, I'm not really interested in Luke, it's a bit long, uh, I'll just keep these three. No, we want all four to give us the full picture of Christ and what he did and why he came. And so it's the same, we want the whole counsel of God when it comes to salvation. We want to know what, what other things has the Bible um, said about salvation. Well, one of the things that the Bible uh, uh, has said is that we ought to um, we ought to repent. There we, go. we ought to repent. Repentance is very very foundational when it comes to salvation. Repentance isn't salvation, by the way. That's why it's a different word. Some people are repentant in their heart, but they haven't yet found salvation in Christ. So repentance itself is not salvation, but uh, repentance precedes salvation. Mark chapter 1 verse 15, uh, the Lord Jesus says, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent first and believe the gospel. So uh, when we look at the Philippian jailer, although he is not told to repent, I think it's fairly clear from his actions and the way in which he throws himself on the floor, shaking and trembling, that repentance has taken place in his heart, that he, he truly wants to, to turn to the Lord. He says, what must I do to be saved? There's no need to start trying to convince him to repent because that repentance has already taken place. What does it mean to repent? Well, repent means to change your mind, to, to completely change your mind. Uh, uh, it's a turning away from, from the life you used to live, and it's a returning uh, to God. Now, some people have said, no, that's not what repentance means. Some people have said, well, repentance is a work, and I'm not saved by works, I'm saved by grace. Repentance is not a work. Acts 11, verse 8 says, God also to the Gentiles granted repentance. He gave it to them. It's a gift. Okay? Now you might be turning to the Lord and away from your sin, but it takes God to give you that gift uh, of, of full repentance to bring you to Him. So it is a gift of God. And when was, uh, like Tyndale says, grace, all grace, it really is. All of God. Some have said, well, repentance is a change of mind. That's all it is. So therefore, um, you know, it's not a change of lifestyle. It's just a change of mind, not a change of lifestyle. And let me give you a little illustration. Let's say that I led a really unhealthy lifestyle. Some of you might think I do. Uh, 
Well, let's say I woke up in the morning and the first thing I'd say, right, time for breakfast, I'll go to McDonald's. And I had myself, uh, uh, I don't know what they serve at that time, but uh, some kind of burger or whatever in the morning, had that great stuff. Lunch time, I'll go to KFC. And I head to KFC and, uh, and, uh, and then it comes to, you know, the evening comes along and I think, well, I'm really hungry. Uh, some of you are liking this, that's not good. <laughs> uh, I'm really hungry. I'll, I'll phone the pizza shop and they'll, they'll, deliver, they'll deliver pizza. And let's say I did that every day. And then after, you know, maybe after like six months or so, I'm saying, do you know, I, you know, I, feel, I feel really ill. I don't feel right. And I'll go and see the doctor. And so I go to the doctor and I say, yeah, yeah doctor, I don't feel very well. So he says, well, what sort of things are you eating? So I tell him and he says, Mr. Jennings, you can't go on living your life like that. You're going to die, you're going to kill yourself, you're going to have a heart attack or something. And I, and I listen to him and it sort of wakes me up. I think, yeah, he's right, I can't do that. And I have a change of mind, right? I think, I've changed my mind about how I'm living. Well then Monday morning comes along and I say, right, I'm just going to go, there's McDonald's, it's open, great, I'll, I'll head. Have I changed my mind? No, I'm, I'm still living exactly the same way. A change of mind should precipitate a change of life as well. Now, I might walk past KFC one day and think, I just can't resist it, and, and go in. And tell, but by and large, and on the whole, I'm not living like that anymore, you understand? Uh, I, I, my change of mind has brought about a real change of heart. And so that's what repentance is. Some people have said, ah, well, repentance just simply means they're not repenting of sin, they're repenting of not believing in Jesus. Anyone heard that before? Uh, it's quite popular now, you know, yeah, repentance means not turning away from your sins, it means turning away from what you used to believe, you didn't believe in Jesus, uh, uh, and now you do believe in Jesus, so repentance is not repentance from sins, well, um, I've got news for you, not believing in Jesus is a sin, it's, it's, it's the sin that people are going to hell for because they didn't put their trust in Jesus, because they didn't believe in him. You don't think that's a sin? Go back and read the Bible. Repentance is a turning away, a forsaking of sin, and a turning back to God. C.H. Spurgeon, quite a popular <coughs> Christian teacher, don't agree with everything he says, but he says some good things. And uh, he put it like this, I like this illustration. He said, um, if you have a pig, and you offer the pig a bucket full of slop, or a nice meal, the pig will go for the slop, because it's always eating slop. And, and the pig doesn't see anything wrong with that. Quite happily eat the slop, you know, not, not a problem. And uh, he says, imagine if you could sort of miraculously turn that pig from being a pig into a man. And you were to, to offer him a bucket full of slop or a lovely plate, plate of food. Which one's the man going to pick? The pick the plate of food. He's going to pick the plate of food. In fact, he's, he's going to think, oh, what, what, what's, this, what's this slop around my mouth? What's this disgusting thing? I don't want that anymore. Hold a nice plate of food. This is what he says. Likewise, when we are truly a child of God, when God has purchased us by the blood of Jesus and saved us, and God is at work in us, we choose differently. We choose differently. We're not trying to impress God. It's just we've changed. Think everything's changed. We are not the same person. He says, we will occasionally put our head back in the slot bucket. Yes, we likely will. But as soon as we do, we will remember that we no longer eat slot, and we will spit it out and wonder why we ever liked it. It's very graphic, isn't it? This? If we're still eating slot and loving it, we have to wonder if we have ever truly been converted. You see, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. 
All things become new life. Some people don't believe that, you know. Some people who, who say that they're Christians don't believe that. We call them easy believists or easy believism. And, you know, they have a Christianity that costs Jesus everything but actually costs you nothing. It costs you nothing. And I'm going to give you a quote. I don't like preaching lights because it, it's kind of negative and so on. But I'm going to give you a quote so you can balance out what I have said and what Spurgeon said. Uh, with what some people are saying today. Okay, this is a quote from a quite a well-known website, a bit of a giveaway there. Um, and this is what this person said. 2 Corinthians 5.17, that's the one we quoted uh, about becoming a new creature, old things have passed away. Yes, he says, 2 Corinthians 5.17 doesn't say that a man's behaviour is changed when he comes to Christ. Really? Okay. But rather, he is a new creature. The new man versus the old man. Catch this. Jesus is the new creature that comes to indwell every believer. Really? Got a problem with that? Jesus is the new creature that comes to indwell every believer. The word creature means... Look at those first, uh, what is it, five letters, C-R-E-A-T, stick an E on the end, that which is created. Do you believe in a Jesus that was created? Oh no. Jesus Christ is the Word, uh, he was with God in the beginning, he was with God and he was God. Jesus Christ is God, he was not created. Now I know that he's probably not thought that through. You know, I'm sure he's not trying to say that, but look how easily we fall into that. When we start saying, Christ doesn't have to be my Lord, right? He doesn't have to be my Kurios. He doesn't have to be my Yahweh. He doesn't have to be my what? My God. Remember that thought I said, keep in mind those who change the grace of God, uh, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying our Lord. Jesus Christ. See how easily you then start walking into error of denying even that Christ is God and Lord. Some will say, Lord, Lord, it won't mean anything because he isn't the Lord of their life. It's just a word, just a name that they use. They have a Christianity that doesn't cost anything. The Bible say, what does Jesus say about coming into the kingdom of God? Count the cost. Count the cost. Now all you have to do is just believe, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess you with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It's easy. You think that's easy? I'll tell you what, you try confessing the Lord Jesus Christ as if you're a Christian in Syria. See if you find that easy. Or, or in Pakistan. Or in Saudi Arabia. You try confessing Jesus Christ as Lord there and tell me if it's easy then. We've just no idea in this country, no, in the West. You've got it so easy. So Christianity doesn't cost you anything. <clears throat> the problem is, you see, Genesis 4 verse 7 says, Sin lieth at the door. Sin is waiting. Your heart must have some body, something that is sitting there as king and lord and controlling, Jesus wants it to be him and if he's not there if he's not the lord of your life then who is your lord is it your flesh is it sin is it the devil who's your lord you know, people say to me well Paul you don't have to give up all your sins to be saved. So Paul, you don't have to have Jesus as your Lord to be saved. They say, you don't have to walk in obedience to Christ to be a Christian. What they don't understand is this. I don't want my sin. I don't want to live with my head in the slot bucket. I've had enough of that. I've got different desires. 
I've got different wants now. A hunger and thirst after righteousness. I don't want to have Christ and still live in darkness and still live with my sins. I don't want my sins. I don't want to live like that. And my mind is on higher things now. I've got different appetites, you know. I'm feeding on the manna from a bountiful supply. I'm drinking from the fountain that never shall run dry. That's what we have in Christ, isn't it? You know, I, I, I don't want my head in a slot bucket of sin. I'm done with all that. If you say you're a Christian, but you want to carry on doing that, and all, all Christ is for you is, is a little insurance ticket, I'll be all right, I'll go to heaven. Then I put this to you, that you truly have not repented of your sins. You really haven't. And that perhaps, <coughs> to use Spurgeon's words, you never were converted. Being a child of Christ, being a new creation, a new creature, means that you have new desires, new senses. But the good news is this, that God can do that for you this morning. You, you, can, you can do that today. You can come and give yourself to Jesus Christ wholly, completely. Walking in obedience to Him through the power of His Spirit. God wants to forgive our sins, forget our sins, and lead you in obedience to Christ. I would really encourage you... Um, if, if you feel that the Lord has spoken to you this morning and either you feel that you, you've been living as a Christian but, but you've not been really giving over your heart to God, I'd encourage you to come and have a chat with me today, this morning. Or if, if you say, well actually I don't really think that I have been converted, I don't really think that I am saved, again I'd encourage you to come for prayer for that because God is willing you know, God does not want any to perish, but wants all to come to repentance. Thank you.